Okay, so at this time we are recording. Again, for your privacy, if you don't wish to be um, part of the presentation, go ahead and turn off your camera. And so uh, stop starting off sort of like why cite? <laughs> what not, part is what is citation? But also, um, do we need to quote? Um, if we do quote, what do we do with it? Um, and before we dive into that, my apologies. My name is Brent Antrim. I'm one of the librarians here. Um, and uh, just a little bit about me, because when I stand up in front of a group and say, hi, I'm an expert, or sit in Zoom, your immediate reaction should be, who are you and what are your credentials? So um, uh, I'm currently the department chair for the library. I've been a librarian here at Santa Monica College for 23 years. And um, I've taught the library one class. In fact, I created the distance ed version of the class. Uh, I have two master's degrees, one in library and information science and one in communication critical theory, and I'm an Air Force veteran. So what that means for you is basically I was a student for 20 years, so I know what it's like to be on the other side of the, of the screen and needing to get information and needing to figure out how to use this not necessarily intuitive or particularly logical system that everybody agreed on in this discipline that I'm not a part of. So, so that sort of dives us into why do I have to follow these rules and what are they? Um, the main reason why you cite is to give credit to the people whose work you've used. Um, essentially, as a researcher, you are building on the foundation of researchers who came before you. And you want to take that research that they have created and interpret it. Uh, use it, rebut it. In some way, you are responding to that and adding your own part to it. So the part that you need to cite is the part that you're using from somebody else because you're using somebody else's work. And this is difficult a lot of times for people to uh, sort of get around because we live in a culture now of collaboratively created information. Everything is a riff on something. If you don't believe it, go take a look at TikTok, right? So everything is an opinion or an idea triggered by other people's work, and then our own unique imagination adds to that. But in research, when we do that, we have to give credit to the people whose work we use, or essentially we're stealing their work, um, and we want to avoid that. So what do you cite? Any quote, anytime you take words directly from a source and use it. Any direct idea or opinion, even a conversation that you have in an interview with someone. When you're paraphrasing, you're taking somebody else's ideas and you're putting them into your own words. This is tough because a lot of people, especially when they're just starting research, are saying, everything I do is paraphrasing. I'm telling people what I read. Well, sort of, and that's why you have a list of works cited. But you're adding some value to that when you're writing your own research. You're taking that foundation and you're not just regurgitating it. You're saying, I took this in, I understood it, and I came up with this idea based on it, okay? Um, when you're summarizing something, and that happens a lot when you're doing research, um, oftentimes you'll find the same idea in multiple sources. So you have to sort of say, in general, this is what scientists say on climate change. You need to sort of, in your work cited, put who those in general people were. <laughs> so if you're summarizing other people's words, you need to include that in your list of works cited too. And not just the words, are you using pictures? Are you using a screen cap of a blog post? Are you using a chart? All of those have to be cited too because they're not your original work. They're other foundational work that you are building on. So what do you not cite? Uh, common knowledge. Hopefully everyone knows that the world is not flat. So having a round spherical world, everybody knows that. So you don't need to cite some expert telling you that although you could go all the way back to Galileo, but why would you want to, right? Um, or well-known facts. Abraham Lincoln was a president of the United States. If you are a student in the United States, you would know that. If you are coming in and you, and you were not from the US and you may not know that, you still don't need to cite that part because the people you're writing for do know that. Okay, so you don't need to look for that fact because it's a well-known, commonly acknowledged fact, okay? If you're unsure, cite it. You know, if you're writing a paper and you're an international student and um, you came from um, I don't know, South Korea and you don't necessarily have that cultural literacy to know certain things and you're unsure, look it up, cite what you looked up. But one thing you never want to do is 
buy a paper. <laughs> it's um, <laughs> it is a shortcut people take. However, it's also um, a stone wall that people run into that can get them kicked out of school. So uh, you know, do your own work, and people will appreciate it very much. Okay. So what happens when you do use other people's work? You're you're committing plagiarism, and there are various levels like red flag, yellow flag, no green flags. There's never a green flag with plagiarism. But the red, um, the biggest, most severe red flag is uh, global plagiarism. That is, I just took this paper and now I'm putting my name on it. Not a copy paste you should do ever. Okay. And then there are some serious plagiarism problems um, that can get you in trouble and get you failed, um, but wouldn't necessarily get you in front of the disciplinarian explaining why you want to stay at SMC. And those are paraphrasing, when you paraphrase other people's words and you forget to give them credit, um, where you do a quote and you don't mark that it's a quote and you don't cite it. Or, and this happens a lot, and this is another one that people have difficulty with, it's called mosaic plagiarism. And that's where you're taking a graph from here and a quote from here and a summary from here, and you don't cite any of it. You have, in essence, taken a whole bunch of other people's work, stitched it together into a paper, and claimed it was all your work. That works on Wiki sometimes. <laughs> it doesn't work for research. It will get you in trouble. And then there are a couple of moderate ones, um, one that most people have never heard of, which is self-plagiarism. So say you're in history class and you write on the Civil War and you write about enslaved peoples. And then you take a sociology class and you're talking about enslaved peoples in the modern world. And you're like, oh, I can use like these three pages from my history paper to talk about, you know, the context for modern enslavement. No, <laughs> that's actually self-plagiarism. Um, it's, it's moderate. It's not something that's going to get you in a deep amount of trouble, but it's lazy research. And oftentimes the instructors who are reading your paper can tell immediately when that's happened because you've written this part for your history professor to certain specifications. And then suddenly whoop, hard left turn. And now you're writing it to your social science teacher. And the, the words are different. The phrasing is different. The, the way you're focusing it is different. For people who grade 500 papers a semester and have done that for the last 10 years, it's really, really obvious. So just think about that. And finally, um, if you cite but you don't get it right, that's a problem. Um, if a person who is reading your paper looks at your citation and is unable to follow that citation back to the source, that's a problem. That's a failure. Okay. Um, so we are going to try the video. Always fun. Building your business online? Can you guys hear that? Go to Wix.com and get your site up and running. With I'm afraid some of you may have relaxed too much and didn't actually write your own papers. In fact, I believe a certain few of you took almost everything right off the internet. Damn. Worry you might be him? Then you should definitely keep watching. Hi, I'm Jessica from Scribber, here to help you achieve your academic goals. Plagiarism is when you use someone else's words or ideas without crediting the source and pass it as your own. It's okay to use others' words and ideas, but you have to cite them. Committing plagiarism might save you time for a short while, but it comes at a high price. Depending on your institution's rules and the type of plagiarism, you might fail your course or even get suspended or expelled from your university. And no one wants that, right? Let's talk about five types of plagiarism you might encounter. Although they differ in severity, it's still not acceptable to commit any kind of plagiarism. And plagiarism checkers like Turnitin can detect all of them very easily. Verbatim plagiarism, also known as copy and paste plagiarism, as its name suggests, is when you directly copy and paste text from a source without citing the author. If you want to use an author's exact words, you need to quote the original source by putting it in quotation marks and include an in-text citation. Check out our video on how to quote. We'll get that. Imagine a patchwork. You take different pieces of cloth and make it into a whole. That's exactly what patchwork or mosaic plagiarism is. You copy phrases and ideas from different sources and put them together to create a new text. In order to piece the different texts together nicely, this kind of plagiarism often includes some paraphrasing. 
it also requires a little more effort than the rest. So if you're already putting in the effort anyways, might as well completely avoid it. If you need a little help on paraphrasing, I got you. Click this video here. Paraphrasing plagiarism is the most common type of plagiarism, so pay extra attention. It's completely okay to paraphrase, but just because you wrote it in your own words doesn't make the idea yours. So remember to give credit and cite the original source. Global plagiarism is when you take someone else's work entirely and use it as your own. That includes if you find a text online and submit it as your own, but also if you get someone to write your essay for you, like her. But this is the exact same paper, word for word, that you can buy for $15 on turnpaper.com. It even has the same title and footnotes. Maybe they copied my paper. <laughs> this is one of the most serious type of plagiarism, as it involves deliberately and directly lying about the authorship of a work. So don't even think about it. You can also commit plagiarism by reusing the work you've previously submitted. This is called self-plagiarism. So no turning in a paper you've already submitted for another class or recycling ideas developed from previous assignments. Just because it's your own work, it still counts as academic dishonesty because you've already gotten credit for the work. Woohoo! Now you're ready to move on to how to avoid plagiarism. Click this video. No, <laughs> I'm not going to click that video. <laughs> so. <clears throat> How do you actually avoid plagiarism? One, be aware of it. All its different myriad forms. Then take specific steps to avoid it. And one of the easiest ways to do this is keep track of where your ideas come from. Whether it's a running notepad list or um, a chart with part of the quote and um, the title or the author and the page where you found it, keep that running um, tally. As a librarian, I have many too many times, had people come running in after they've completely finished their paper because they have a quote and they don't remember where they got it. And now they have to desperately backtrack trying to figure out, was it a book? Was it a journal article? Did I find this on a blog? And they say, help me. And I'm like, how? Because you can't search by quote. You can search by author or title, even by publisher, but not by quote. Okay. Cite your sources as properly as you can. And here I want to recommend a couple of things that we're going to talk about in depth later, which are MLA sites, um, OWLs or online writing labs. And very importantly, the examples that your instructor gives you if they give you one. Uh, the reason why I say this is because citation is as much an art as a science. And sometimes an instructor will have a format that they really like that has been updated, but they are still going to grade you on that, say, MLA eighth instead of ninth. It's not factually correct, but it's what they want and it impacts your grade. So if they give you an example, follow it, okay? Always cite quotes or paraphrases and present your own ideas and be proud of those ideas because those ideas sprang from all of the work that you did to find and understand this other research. Um, and if you have access to turn it in, use plagiarism checker because you know your teacher is gonna we're going to avoid the avoid plagiarism <laughs> and head on into the next thing, which is, okay, that's great. I now know what it is. I can identify it. I want to get away from it. How do I do that? Okay. And as a reminder for anyone who came in a little bit later, please keep yourself muted. We are currently recording. Keep your camera off if you don't want to be seen. And I will take a break in uh, about halfway through the um, presentation in order to answer chat questions. So if you have questions, please do use chat. So what information do you need to properly cite your article or your book or your blog or your video? A lot of stuff. You won't necessarily have all of that stuff when you go looking. So if you don't have all of that stuff, use what you can find. Because the purpose of citation, besides giving credit, is to allow your readers to find what you used. And if you have enough information for them to find it, even if they don't have a secondary container title and date of access, you can still find it. And that's what's the important reason for you to do that, okay? And I'm going to show you a website here. This is, are you seeing the website? Yay, Zoom followed me, that's exciting. <laughs> so this is actually from the Modern Language Association. And a quick note, the MLA is a group of people who work in that field who get together and talk about citation and what works and what doesn't work for their field of inquiry. 
for their discipline. And then they put out this book and says, everybody who wants to write in our field, here are the rules that you follow. So anyone in our discipline will know what to look for and what information they need, okay? So some of the citations include books, edited books. You notice you have a little bit of extra information. Translated books, a little extra information. Different types of online works. So you find a magazine article, it might look like this. You find a book, it looks a little similar, but still a little bit different. For example, you have page numbers in a book that you don't have an article. If you have a journal article from an academic journal, it again looks even more different because it has things like volumes and numbers and dates on it that you may not necessarily have in other things. So it's not one size fits all. And this can be really intimidating when you first start doing citation because it's like, oh my God, there's so much stuff. This is where I say, go back to the examples, figure out what it is you're trying to cite and then look for an example of that and follow that example. Okay. And then there's other things like songs, whether you see them on a website, an album or in person, movies, whether you see them in person or whether they're streaming, a TV show from a physical medium, in other words, a DVD, images, different kinds of images, a print magazine versus a painting versus a photograph that you see in person. So yeah, it can be really confusing when you do this and that's why they have examples for you. So don't feel like you have to memorize all of this. God knows I don't and I teach it. Every time that I go through and I grade a work cited, I have a, a template sheet so that I don't miss it because it's really detail oriented. It's not difficult, but it's detailed, okay? So did everybody follow me back to the PowerPoint? Excellent. So along the way, as you're looking at this, you're going to have to, um, I'm gonna move this so I can actually see. You're going to have to format both the individual citations and the page as a whole. So some things about the page as a whole. The entire page uses Times New Roman font size 12. It has a title with no extra spaces before the citations start. Every single citation uses a half inch hanging indent. Do not use bold anywhere for anything. Do not underline anything. And this confuses people because they've said, but I've seen things underlined in citations. That's because when you're handwriting a citation, anything that would be in italics if you typed it is underlined because writing italics is really hard. But if you're typing it, and I hope you're all typing them, use italics instead, okay? The entire page is double spaced with no extra lines between citations, between the title and the citation. It's just literally the whole page is double spaced, okay? And um, I see a hand raised. So let me go ahead and say, yes, what's your question? You were to paraphrase um, statistics like say like in the year of 2016, this happened with the like statistics basically. Can you paraphrase that? Like statistics? Yes, you can paraphrase anything. And it's not uh, plagiarism? So, huh? And it's not plagiarism? It is plagiarism if you don't cite it. If you paraphrase it and you cite it, then it's not plagiarism. Okay. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Good question. So heading into the next, where do I go to find these examples? What do I do? Um, there are several. One is on the SMC library homepage. And if this doesn't ever follow, let me know because it follows on my screen, but sometimes doesn't follow on other people's. And it gives you on the library homepage, on the left-hand side, citation style guidelines. So you can go there directly from the library homepage. Okay. In addition, there are a couple of really useful online writing labs or OWLs. I personally love that they're called OWLs. One is from Purdue, um, Purdue University, and it has, as you see, a lot of good infra information. Um, including general guidelines, formatting first pages. This is taken directly from the MLA Handbook, ninth edition. Another one that I really like is the Excelsior Writing Lab from Excelsior College. This one to me seems a little easier to navigate, 
over here in the frame, it makes it a lot um, more straightforward as to what they have and how to find it. Um, so, and if you're unsure, you can always literally just Google Excelsior OWL and it will bring it up. Okay. And then finally, we have library research guides or pathfinders that include what I find uh, to be a very useful page. I actually give this to my students um, that gives examples of in-text citations, which we're gonna talk about in just a little bit. A breakdown of how to use the template of core elements and what those core elements actually are. Think of a citation like building Legos. You're just putting blocks together. These are the blocks. Okay. And then it gives examples of specific types of citations. Okay. And this, is on the library homepage. We have LibGuides listed. It's under the Introduction to Research LibGuide. Okay. I'm gonna take a short break here and take a look at chat. Uh, good question, can you cite yourself? Um, not really. <laughs> and this is one way that people have tried to get around self-plagiarism. It's like, I did this in my history class. What I would recommend, and it's actually a lot less work and will be less apt to make your instructor go, Hmm. Um, is just, you did the research once already, find a new way to say it. Find a fresh way to use that research in a way that in context with this new assignment makes sense, right? They're not asking you to do brand new research if you've already got research that you've done. They're asking you to do brand new writing on that research, okay? The second question is, my English teacher does not want double spaced and no times Roman. Your English teacher is not following MLA format. <laughs> also, your English teacher is the one giving you the grade. So keep in mind while you're doing this that there's the right way and there's the following instructions way. If there's no instructions given, do it the way MLA says. But if the instructions that you're given to fulfill the assignment contradict MLA format, follow those instructions that you're given so that you get a good grade and just know when you're doing it that other people will not ask for it in that same way. Okay. The website does not provide MLA 8th edition because the field has not used MLA 8th in two years. Um, MLA 9th came out in April of, I think, 2020. So um, that's a really good question because again, sometimes your instructors will say, you're using this example and yes, it's MLA 8. So the tip for that, when you're unsure, it's like, this is not right, what do I do? Do what your teacher tells you to do. Just realize that they're not necessarily following the rules and that happens. Um, keep in mind also that sometimes the databases, and we'll do this in just a little bit, will give you an MLA 8th edition it is different than MLA 9th. So you will have to fix it before you stick it in your paper. Okay, and that's where this comes in handy. Okay, heading back to this. So those are all different ways that you can, you can do that. Um, but one thing we haven't really talked much about is that there is a difference between your works cited, which is a list of everything that you used in your paper, everything that you quoted in one way or another, and the actual format of the paper that includes connecting those quotes to that list of works cited. And that's what an in-text citation does. An in-text citation is the bridge between your content and your list of sources. So we're going to watch a short video. Hey, business owners, stop okay. overpaying for internet and phone. Switch to Spectrum Business and, and get 600 mega- So it shouldn't be the ad. The MLA Style Guide was recently updated to meet the information needs present in the digital age. The new Style Guide features a universal set of guidelines that can be applied to any kind of work. It is important to ensure that you cite all the sources that you consult for your assignments. This includes sources that have been quoted, paraphrased, or summarized. If you didn't come up with the idea, it needs a citation. Citations are important because they ensure that you are properly attributing ideas to their creators. 
Citations also allow other people to access and evaluate the sources that you have consulted in your assignment. It is important to include both in-text citations as well as a works cited list. First, we will focus on how to create a works cited list, which will be at the end of your assignment. When thinking about how to cite sources in MLA format, the first things to consider are the core elements of the source. The core elements are author, title of source, title of container, other contributors, version, number, publisher, publication date, and location. So for example, if I'm referencing Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, I can find the following core elements. Different kinds of sources contain different kinds of information. The goal of MLA citations is to provide the reader with the most complete citation possible. It is okay if your source does not contain all of the core elements. The new edition of the MLA makes it easy to include the information that is available and exclude the information that is not. After you have listed your core elements, it is time to compile the core elements into a citation. A complete citation may look like the following. Notice that after each core element, there is either a period or a comma. For Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, our citation may look something like this. Author, title of source, other contributors, version, publisher, publication date, and location. Once you have finished creating a citation for all of your sources, they must be properly formatted. First, make sure that your list is presented in alphabetical order. Second, make sure that if the citation is more than one line, the second line has been indented five spaces from the left. Lastly, ensure that the entire list is double-spaced. In addition to works cited, your assignment must also contain in-text citations. In-text citations help the reader find the corresponding entry in the works cited list and the passage in that source. In MLA, in-text citations include the first entry in the works cited list, which is usually the author, and then a page number. Depending on your sentence structure, you can create an in-text citation in a few different ways. The author and the page number may be at the end of the passage, or author may be included in the sentence and the page number listed at the end of the passage. Need more help? McMaster Libraries has an MLA style guide. And then it gets into marketing for them. <laughs> now keep in mind that that was for eighth edition MLA, but the in-text citations didn't change between eighth and ninth. <clears throat> so, as they mentioned, you could have it with the author and the page number within the quote, at the end of the quote, or broken out with the author's name as part of your sentence and the page number at the end. Okay. And there are a number of different ways to do this. Again, if your instructor gives options or gives examples, take a look at those examples and follow their, their what we need to do. Okay. Um, so, Heading from in-text to what it's linked to. Um, here are some breakdowns of some how you cite, how you cite things. Um, the book site, um, whether it's in print or electronic format, contains the author, the title, the publisher, and the publication date. If it's an ebook, you have a little format blurb that you can add in there. Okay, and you see that right down here. For authors, for MLA, this is very different than APA if you've used that citation style. One, two, and three or more authors are formatted differently. It's always, the first person is always last name first because that is how you put it in alphabetical order in the list of works cited. But if you have two people, then the second person is first name, last name because you're not using them to put them in alphabetical order. And if you have three or more people, and this is where it's really nice to have research teams with 15 people on them, you list the first people listed, not alphabetically, but the first person listed in that group, and then et al., which is sort of Latin for everyone else. Okay. And this is an example of how that would look for an ebook. It's two authors, last name first with the first person, so you can alphabetize it correctly in your works cited. The title of the book is in italics. Notice periods at the end of these content notes. And then you're talking about the book itself. It's an ebook edition from this publisher on this date. So that has commas between each part because it's all one unit that they're talking about. Okay. Now, how about scholarly journal articles? As you notice, there's a lot more information 
in scholarly journal articles than there are in books because a book published once, done. Published again, it's either a reprint or a new edition, still the same format. Journal articles, lots of publication going on. They could come out monthly, quarterly, annually, irregularly. So you have to help people find where it's at. So this one gives the author, this is one of those research groups. So the first one listed, the article title is in quotes. And then you start talking about the journal itself. So there's a little bit more to it. There's the title of the journal in italics, the volume and number, the date and the page numbers. Then you're talking about the container for that journal. It came from the JSTOR database and here is its stable URL or its DOI, which is a digital object identifier. It's kind of like a fingerprint for that particular paper, okay? Um, things to keep in mind, an article is a smaller part of the larger whole. So the article is in quotes, the larger whole, the journal article is in italics. So the container is in italics. That journal and many, many other journals is contained within the database. So the database title is also in italics. That's why these are in quotes, these are in italics, okay? A uh, quick note for chat and then I have a raised hand. Okay, uh, the MLA citation examples are at the beginning of this presentation. So we'll go back um, over that at the end. So we're not looping back until we finish the first presentation. It will be there. Um, if we're quoting a character's words, um, you're still quoting the work of that author. So the in-text citation would still be the author's name and the page number, okay? The question is, if we're quoting a character's words, do we still include the author's name in the text? Yes, because it's not common knowledge information. You are quoting an author's words, okay? And um, when the research journal offers a cited link, is it okay to copy and paste that? Sort of. <laughs> and this is a really good question because there are two kinds of links in a database. When you do a database search, every time you do the search, it gives you a new link. So the link up at the top, this link up here, will change with every search. So you can't use it in a citation because if somebody tries to use it again, they won't find that article. But somewhere within the article, it should give you what they call a stable URL. Use that stable URL and that will take them back to it. And if it has a DOI, if it has a digital object identifier, use that instead of the URL. Because when you use a URL, for example, from JSTOR, that URL only works in JSTOR. But say for some reason you don't have access to JSTOR and you still need this journal. That DOI will find that article in any database. That makes sense? Okay. Um, next question. Uh, if an instructor is distributing materials without citation, then you cry at them <laughs> until they give you some information. Um, and I say that because oftentimes people will uh, distribute um, an essay from a book, for example. If you need to cite that, you have to find out what book it came from. I helped a student in chat with two open education resource um, book essays, and we were able to very quickly Google it, find out what book it was originally in, and cite that book. So you do have to cite it if you're using somebody else's words. The instructor is not plagiarizing necessarily because open education resources are actually built to be reused. However, and I say this as a librarian and for copyright, if they are using OERs, they are supposed to attribute where they get it from. So somewhere in, that, um, in their presentation on Canvas, they should have a source because OERs are attributable. If it's not, then your instructor is not doing right by copyright. So they may not even be aware they're plagiarizing because some instructors don't have the best understanding of OER, of OER but that's where they need to talk to their librarian. Okay. Oh, but the person I'm talking about, she's the lead of the OER, and I'm pretty sure she is distributing copyrighted material. But I know mm -hmm. that instructors have leeway because, right, like... No, they do not. Not when it comes to copyright. Not when, okay. No, an open license does not mean that you, can't, that you don't attribute. You oh still... no, it's no, no. The material for sure I found it wasn't it wasn't OER, but I think the class uh, is designated that uses OER materials. You'd have to bring that up with your instructor. Yeah, cool. because that is a copyright violation. Yeah. yeah. 
very good points. Okay, heading back into here. Um, here are some examples of other things besides books and articles that you might need to cite. Uh, an interview, for example, or a painting or an online album. Notice these are not formatted correctly because PowerPoint wouldn't let me, which is why I have pictures for the other citation examples. Okay, so which is actually a good thing to always remember. Oftentimes we will copy and paste a citation. If you do that, fix it before you turn it in. Always fix it before you turn it in. So you know why you need to cite, you know what you need to cite, you know how you need to cite, what do you actually cite? So I'm gonna let you look at this for just a second while I take a drink of water. <laughs> we are going to do a database search. I'm going to do a database search to show you um, <clears throat> using a specific database. But there are a couple of different things on the library homepage. There's something called OneSearch. Be careful when using this because sometimes it attempts to give you access to things that publishers won't actually allow us to access. And we have no control over this. We've been fighting it for three years now. and We still can't get the people who code this to do the right thing. So be careful. Sometimes it says you have access or it says something is a book and it's actually a journal article. So we are fighting them on this. Just be careful of what you get from that. Um, the other option is to go into our databases um, and look specifically, which is actually what I highly recommend. Um, so what that looks like. Oh, one thing. A lot of times people will ask us about citation generators. There's a lot of junk out there, <laughs> um, but there are also citation generators within our databases. So anytime you use a citation generator, whether you're copying and pasting from Business Source Elite or you're going to um, CiteMe um, or EasyBib, Always take whatever product they give you and fix it before you turn it in. Okay, even though they make a living at this, it is Autobot. And Autobots don't often catch the detailed information that can make your citation incorrect. I've seen things like, oh, gee, we completely forgot the title of the book. Or, oh, let's put the author first name um, last. Or, uh, yeah, first name first instead of last name first. Okay, that screws up the authorization for your entire work cited. That's a problem, right? So I'm going to do a live database search. Um, and I wanted to give you a chance to take a screen cap of this page because one of the things that I've worked very hard on for the last couple of years is creating database tours um, on our library YouTube channel. So um, if you're stuck on using a database and you just want a how-to, you don't necessarily want to do a chat with a librarian, which you can always do. Um, head to YouTube, to our YouTube channel, um, and see if we have a database tour on it, because I think it would be quite helpful. So um, I'm going to head into, if this will let me. So on the school homepage, in order to get to the library, because it's not linked from the homepage, you have to mouse over student support and click on library. Okay. Once you do, one search is here. And also there's an hour long workshop on how to do this. So I'm not going to go into too much. Um, I'm just going to show you how to quickly retrieve an article. If you go into databases, they're grouped by topic. And everything that we subscribe to is listed alphabetically under all databases. And we are adding new databases all the time and sometimes removing them if they don't get used. So the one I'm going to show you very quickly is Academic Search and Master File Complete. It's our most general database. And I'm going to look for information on dolphins. And then I'm going to quickly say, I don't need 16,000 of them. I need something current. Last five years, maybe. And as you see, many of these are academic journals. If you want to make sure that you get academic journals, you can say, give me just academic journals right here. So in two limiters, date range and format, I've cut out about 10,000 articles. Okay. So then I can pick one. And when I click on that, it will give me some options. And I'm going to close this for a sec so I can see it. On the right-hand side, you can add it to your Google Drive, to your OneDrive. You can print it, email it, save it, cite it. 
And when you cite, it will give you options. It defaults alphabetically. And we are not in Brazil, so we don't need the Brazilian national um, standards. So we scroll on down, and it gives me MLA 9th. So I can copy and paste that into my Word document. And before I even go anywhere, I notice right off the bat, it has EBSCOhost, which is the publisher of the database. So I would want to change that to say academic search, because it's actually in the academic search database not the EBSCO database. Okay, So that's how you find it quickly. And the reason why I say that is because if you are in Library 1 and you are here for extra credit, you are going to be doing an MLA worksheet. And if you just want to apply the things that you've learned in this workshop, you can also do this worksheet. And I think it's a very useful one. So please take a snapshot of this uh, short URL because this is how your instructor is going to give you extra credit if you are in Professor Cruz's Library One class. And if you just want to see, can I do this? This is how you do that. And this, where did it go? Oh no, this is what it looks like. So it walks you through the search. It gives you places to give a breakdown of what you find when you do that search, and everything that you are pulling out is something that you are going to use to create a citation. Okay, And then for extra credit, there are subject terms there up at the top of that record that I showed you, and you can add those for extra credit. Questions on this part? Okay. If yes. You need yes. Does this apply to every class or just that one class? No, the library one, um, very good segue. The library one class um, does this MLA and she has specifically stated she will give extra credit points if they fill out that worksheet. This uh, particular workshop is going to be archived online. And sometimes instructors will take this archived workshop and use it for extra credit later on. So that form may have timed out by then. So for those people, we have a code word. So the code word for this one is kudos, because what you are doing when you are giving citations or making citations is you are giving kudos to the creator of that content. So ask your teacher which they would rather have. And if you need help, you can visit us in person, eight to five, Monday through Thursday. Come winter, we're going to be adding Fridays because we'll have enough staff finally. Um, we have Ask a Librarian chat, which is 24-7. If you contact Ask a Librarian during the hours that we are open, if we are not in teaching a workshop, you will have an SMC librarian answering chats. Otherwise, and the rest of the time, 24-7, you will be talking to a college or university librarian from another institution we belong to an international consortium of libraries and we all answer each other's questions. Um, and you can ask us a question either through our library homepage or embedded in the interface in most all of our databases. Any database that allows us to embed it, not all will allow it. But if they do, then we do it. Um, so are there any other questions? Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording at this point. Um, Thank you very much for coming today.